As a DM, you have great power. The power to manipulate your players. But should you? Yes, yes you should. In fact, some of the world's most famous DMs manipulate their players all the time. They make their players feel interested, they make them engaged, they make them want things, and they make them feel things. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. Chris Perkins is up first, and he has a trick that he sometimes uses, which is to describe a scene vaguely, then let the players ask for more details. Give them the most important details, like the details they need. For example, you're walking down a road and you come across a big gate with a big lock on it. Then wait for your players to ask a question. They may ask for more details about the gate or the lock, or they may ask, is there anybody else about? In which case you can be like, well, yes, there is. There's someone in a distance walking towards you. They may ask, oh, is there like a fence? And is there anything in the fence? And you can be like, there is a fence next to the gate. And in fact, there's a hole that's been cut through the fence recently. This allows the players to take in the scene bit by bit and it stops you from just giving a wall of text which will just overwhelm them. It also just reinforces a back and forth between the DM and the players having both sides talking equally to make it more of a collaboration and it also means the only things that get focused on are the things that the players are interested in and stops what sometimes happens to me where I throw in just a little bit of flavour and say something like you're in a house and there's some cobwebs in the corner and then my players hyper fixate on the cobwebs because they're like, why would he bring them up if they weren't important? And then I have to create a whole subplot that the owner of the house turns into a spider between the hours of 6pm and 6am. But most importantly, this tactic stops the players feel like they're being railroaded as much. And if they want to spend longer in a scene asking questions, getting more details, they can. But equally, if they just want to get what they need and move on, they can do that too. Chris Perkins also has a great tip for getting your players invested in your story. Obviously, we know you can get your players invested into your main story by tying it into their character stories, their backstories. But what if your players haven't given you a backstory at all? Or what if their backstory just doesn't leave much flexibility for you to intertwine it? What if your player's just there for the ride? Which is fine. Well, you can still get them invested and pull them into the main story by tying events, not to their backstory, but to their character's class, species, or background. Something all characters have, no matter how little effort their players put in during character creation. For example, tying an event into a character's class, maybe your party comes into a town and there's a bard talent show going on, Battle of the Bard. You better believe that if there's a bard in your group, they are invested right now. And then you can link the event into your main story or have major players involved in your main story take part in the event as well. And suddenly your bard is in it and none of it has anything to do with the character's backstory at all. And you'd be surprised just how invested characters can get when you do things like this. It's especially useful when you have players who really are only there for like socializing and combat. And finally, one more Chris Perkins tip. You're not just a storyteller, you're a director too. By that he means know where to shine the spotlight, know what and who to focus on and when, and know when to move on when a scene's finished. And this is great advice because sometimes a DM really wants to leave the, the driving force of the story to their players so that the players control the pacing because that's player agency and it's the player's choice what happens from scene to scene. But your players don't know the grand plan and they have egos and wants and desires that may not align with the other party members. It's also very common for players to freeze up when they lack direction. So direct them. If one player is doing something that you think will serve the overall story and everyone else better than what other people are doing, focus on that player more in that moment. If the players are dragging their heels and not going to get a quest from an NPC, even though you've left plenty of clues that they need to go and get a quest from that NPC, then bring the NPC to them. You can't control the players, but you can control everything else. Chris Perkins uses an example of what he does when his players are taking too long to get going, to move on from a scene. Say they need to get going on this big adventure and they need to hit the road, but they're just still hanging out in the tavern and things are starting to drag and you can see some players getting bored. Chris Perkins will just fast forward at this point. He'll just say, okay, it's the next day. You guys are now on the road to your destination. What's everyone doing? And you can totally do this in a way where you kind of ask permission from your players first. You can be like, okay guys, is everyone cool if we move on, if we just jump ahead and you're on the road? And often your players will just agree with you. It's time to move on. I'd actually take this idea that you are like a writer director, not just a storyteller to the next level. And say you should often be controlling 
the creative vision of the game. Brennan Lee Mulligan does this really well, with the way that he evokes feelings. In a lot of his games, he not only adheres to a style, like his Never After campaign, where it's all horror and creepy, but he also often uses sound effects and events and twists to tug and pull on his players' emotions. The best example of this I have seen is in Calamity, where Brennan foreshadows that something bad is about to happen, like end of the world bad. Then he uses an explosion to signal that it could indeed be happening right now. Then, well, check out the clip for yourself. Clip. As all of you stand from your seats at the ivy table, outside, you hear, oh, oh, dude, no. The fireworks extravaganza has oh, begun. <laughs> this is so good because Brennan took his players on a roller coaster of emotions here, where he played with expectations beautifully. Matthew Mercer has a tendency to make recurring NPCs. Having the same one show up time after time means that the players are more likely to get attached. Some probably more than others, but when your players do eventually connect with an NPC, you can really use the NPC to spur action from their characters. Whether the NPC asks a very personal favour from the players, or maybe the NPC gets kidnapped, or maybe the NPC betrays the party. Whatever you do with this, you will see motivation from the players and, and movement and progress like you've never seen before. And you can have NPCs show up again and again in your campaigns in a few different ways. The most easy one is to have a hub, like a village or a city that the players go back to often, and you can leave the NPC exactly where you left them. But say your players travel around a lot, say they're going to a new place every couple of sessions, and they never really go back on themselves. Well, you can have the NPC traveling to similar places to them. Maybe it's a traveling salesman who just keeps popping up accidentally in really dangerous areas. Or you can have friendly rivals that are literally on the same quest as the players. So you keep seeing them in the exact same places the players are in. Or you could even just have an NPC flat out travel with the players. Just don't make them too powerful and make them seen and not heard and only let them speak when they're spoken to. That sounds abusive, but it's okay, NPCs aren't people. Also, if you like these videos and the tips that I pretty much steal from famous DMs, but wish you could get it in a better formatted and more organized way, then I'm gonna be creating a Word document with everything in there, and it's gonna be by category. It's gonna be like how these DMs prep for their games, how they run combat, how they create NPCs, and it's something I'm going to be adding to over time. I figured the way that I make videos, it's kind of disorganized, it's kind of all over the place, I apologize, but by getting it all into a document, it will help people go back and, and find old stuff way more easily. And if you want access to this document, join my Patreon. I currently have six people. So if you're interested in that, Patreon link in the description below, and you can also subscribe or join my Discord. Every little helps. Okay, Matt Mercer also makes recurring villains too, which means the players can really latch onto them and hate them, and then be spurred on to defeat them. Having a dark lord that needs to be defeated in some far off kingdom, that's fine. Maybe the players will have motivation to do that. But having a dark lord that keeps showing up every single session, slapping one of the player characters in the face, then running off, narrowly escaping with their life, you better believe the players are going to band together and make defeating that villain a priority. This is figuratively, of course. But having a villain show up repeatedly and rubbing shoulders with the player characters is a great way to keep the villain and the main story at the top of the players' minds. Matthew Mercer's tip for recurring villains is to have the villain not really have a want or desire to fight the players, at least at the start. Having a villain who actively just wants to defeat and kill the players only leads to very quick conclusions. And there's only so many times a villain can come face to face with the party in a fight to the death and for it not to end with death. Equally, you can run into that old storytelling cliche where the villain can kill the players and they just decide to leave them alive for some reason, usually telling them all their plans first, or the classic, the villain thinks they killed the players, but really they just kick them off a waterfall and the players washed up on the riverbed below, barely alive. It can feel forced. So by having your villain interested in other things rather than just killing your players, then not only does it make the world feel like it's got other moving parts to it, fleshes the whole thing out, it also gives the bad guy more depth. Matt 
usually likes to have his villains not interested in the party at all at the start. Doesn't even know who they are. But, you know, they keep running in the same circles. The party keeps thwarting mini plans by the villain. The party starts to get more and more annoying to the villain. The villain starts sending lackeys and minions and trying other ways to kind of stop the party. And then eventually the villain is just like, you know what, I'll do it myself. In my personal experience, I actually like having a group of villains, like seven of them. That way, if one of them fights the party and dies, you have six more left. Anime actually uses this a lot in general. Every arc is like the main protagonist fighting one of the masters of the evil group. And it gives the protagonist a way to have victories and defeat a major bad guy, but not defeat the organization. But for Matt, a good villain is someone who doesn't want the players dead straight away. Maybe she just wants to pay the players off or find alternative ways to get them off her case. Maybe she even wants to hire the party to help her. They just don't want them as an obstacle anymore. And for most people in a living, breathing world where there's consequences, Killing six people isn't the first go-to thing that you would do because that can draw unwanted attention or waste valuable resources. And equally, not every villain has to be a bloodthirsty killing machine. They can become that as the campaign goes on. You can turn them into that, but they don't have to start that way. And next up is not what can we learn from these famous DMs, but more what can we learn from really bad DMs on Reddit. Take this Reddit post, for example. I've experienced playing with a DM that out right manipulates their players by making jokes about their character's behavior. Snide and passive aggressive comments to get them to stop what they're doing by making them feel bad and for them to do an action that is favorable to the house. Now most of my tips in this video are about affecting and manipulating your players but to an extent your players know what you're doing and they allow it. They are yes anding you but with emotions. Like when you go to the cinema to watch a horror movie and you could sit there and you know be logical and not get scared at all. Like just watch the movie and be like, hmm, that's good acting. Or, oh, I wonder how many takes that took. But most people will sit there and allow themselves to be scared because that's what they went to the movie for. They understand all the techniques that are happening. They understand the suspenseful music. They understand the slow movement of the camera. They know exactly what the filmmakers are doing, but they let them do it. Manipulating your players in a game of D&D &D should be very similar. You should not be making your players feel any kind of negative emotions to get them to do anything in your games. And this Reddit post actually goes on to bring up another interesting thing. Another note, quite similar to manipulation are railroading and the illusion of choice. To what extent is it acceptable that a DM can secretly change details behind the scene so that no matter what the players do, it will only lead to a certain scene the DM wants them to play? And now I don't think I'm qualified enough to tell you that DMs should do this or that, they should railroad, they shouldn't railroad, but I can give you my opinion. And that's that there are different levels of railroading. There's like very strict railroading, which is really bad, but there's gentle railroading, which I think can be better. I like to think of the TV show Lost from like, I think 2004. The first season is like one of the best seasons of TV ever created, even to this day. But it became very clear as the seasons went on that the writers had no idea where it was going. They were kind of just flailing about and making it up as they went along. There was no structure, there was no direction. I think D&D games that go full sandbox and like move completely away from railroading can often have this exact same problem. Now some work, if you get the the right DM and you get the right players, sure, it will it will work great for you. But I think a little bit of, of pull, a little a little bit of gentle railroading is the wrong term, so all negative connotations, but yeah, certainly uh, direction from the DM. I think that goes a long way, especially if your players agree with you on what kind of story you guys want to tell. If everyone's on the same page and everyone wants to achieve something and move in a direction, then yeah, that can end up with the DM not only being the one railroading, but the players as well. I'm sure if you're DM, you've probably played with one of those players who is just like, I would do this because it's what my character would do. And then every time they just keep doing stuff that their character would do in the moment and it's pointless and it doesn't add to the story and it doesn't add to the plot and it doesn't develop character. And you kind of wish in those moments that the player railroaded themselves a little bit. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I'm talking about.
I believe the best kind of D&D is when the players and the DM get together to tell a story. You don't know how the story is going to end or how you're going to get there, but you have an idea that you you want there to be a beginning, middle and end and you want there to be pacing and momentum. So if you want to find out exactly how to make a story like that with your players or learn a bunch more storytelling tricks from the world's most famous DMs, check out this video now. Wow, my fridge just started making very loud noises.